Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to worship at Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad to be gathered together with you for worship this morning. Um, would you please stand as we are called together for worship by God's word. Psalm 30, verses 4 through 12. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever.
1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 16. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Amen. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be bought to you, to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so you be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy.
Father, this morning we are so grateful for grace that is greater than all of our sin. For Lord, you have shown us that this world takes us down paths that we never would have expected. Sometimes, Father, we are drawn away from your side. We walk roads we never would have expected we would walk. We fall away from you. And yet your word tells us that you are there with us step by step. You are there with us every step of the way. And even when we sin, even when we fall away from you, you are there to catch us. And so when we confess our sin, you are still God. You are faithful and just. And you remove that sin from us. That is grace. Your word tells us that that grace is farther than the east is from the west. It will go as far as we go. It will remove our sin so far from us that it would be like it never happened. We have so much to thank you for this morning, Father. And grace is the beginning of that. So, Lord, we thank you for your grace, for your love for us. We thank you for bringing us here this morning. We thank you for the beautiful sun. We thank you for the faces that are seated next to us this morning. We thank you for the warmth of this place and the warmth of this family. And, Father, now we ask that as we gather in worship, you would give us your Holy Spirit, that our worship would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Welcome once again to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad to be gathered together with you this morning. If you are here for Sunday school this morning, would you please make your way to the back of the sanctuary? Our teachers are ready to gather together with you this morning. For all of you big Sunday school kids, we are so glad to be gathered again with you this morning for worship. We're so glad to see the sun this morning, huh? And uh, what a heat wave. (laughs) We've barely made it above zero, and it's already a heat wave. That's so fantastic. Let me uh, get right into some announcements this morning, because we have a a lengthy list of things that are happening in the life of the church uh, in the coming days, so let me just get right in. Uh, This coming Saturday, January 27th, is our first movie night of the season. We are very excited for this. Uh, It is going to take place downstairs in the Welcome Center. Remember, we're going to remove the furniture. We're going to create our own uh, movie theater down there. And you're going to help us by doing that. When you come, you're going to bring uh, a camping chair, a lawn chair, something of that nature. We will have some extra chairs for those who maybe don't have those. Um, But please come and join us 6 p.m. for our movie night. We're going to be watching The Bridge to Terabithia. Uh, There will be a concession stand. Uh, There's no cost to come and see the movie. The only uh, cost would be if you purchase something from the concession stand, which we will have hot dogs, nachos, popcorn, candy, all the fun movie theater things. That starts at 6 p.m. this coming Saturday evening. No need to sign up. Just come and join us and bring a friend, bring a neighbor, bring a relative, bring somebody. We would love to join together with you. Um, Also coming up a week after that, Saturday, February 3rd, is our uh, first uh, Saturday morning fellowship breakfast uh, for this season. Um, We will gather together at 8.30 a.m. in the Beacon Room for a hot breakfast. Um, And then uh, we will have a Bible study together. This begins at 8.30. We usually wrap up between 10, 15, and 10.30 uh, at the latest. So you still have the whole day to get a lot of things done. Um, But it is a great way to get your day started and get your weekend started. Um, Please plan to join us. Um, I'll be leading study that morning. Um, And just... You know, if, if you're not, if you're a person who uh, doesn't normally participate in Bible study, this is a great option for you. It's uh, very low key, very conversational, um, just 
bring your Bible if you have one. If not, we have lots of extra Bibles. And join us at 8.30 for a hot breakfast and study uh, Saturday, February 3rd. The very next day, Sunday, February 4th, uh, we will have one of our missionaries here. Um, his name is Ryan Karp, and he is from Chosen People, Mission, uh, Chosen People Ministries. Um, this morning, as you were coming into the sanctuary, I believe Kurt, or somebody, right, Kurt, was handing out um, some brochures for you or little cards about that. Some of you have asked if there was something you could hand to like a neighbor or someone with information about this event. So that is certainly something that you could um, you know, put on your refrigerator, but also you could use that to hand out to a friend or someone who might be interested in joining us for this event. Um, if you would like more copies of that, uh, Jeannie, are you in here? Yeah, there you are. Sorry. Um, I think we have extra copies too, right? Okay. So you could see Jeannie um, and she can get you extra copies of that if you'd like more. Um, but we'd love to have you join us uh, Sunday, February 4th, 2 p.m. for a coffee house conversation with Ryan Karp. Um, the title of his message is God's Roadmap to Peace in the Middle East. Um, he will be discussing uh, sort of a look at what's happening in the Middle East, in Israel, Gaza, um, that war that's going on from a biblical perspective, from a Jewish perspective, and from a Christian perspective. So it'll be a very interesting presentation. We'd love to have you come for this. There's no cost to this. We will take a um, free will, like a love offering, to um, that'll go directly to Ryan and his family. Um, that's one of the ways that he provides for his family. So we'd love to have you participate in that, but you're certainly not required to. Uh, but that is... Uh, February 4th at 2 p.m. Saturday, February 10th, is uh, Feed My Starving Children. That is our next opportunity to do uh, service at Feed My Starving Children. Um, if you've never participated in this, it's a great way to, to, to serve some people who are very much in need to provide uh, meals for folks who otherwise would not have them. We go and we pack these meals um, at the location in Schaumburg. We start at 11.30 a.m. You need to arrive about 11.15, and we wrap up uh, shortly around 1 o'clock, right? Um, and so uh, if you would like to help, there is a sign-up sheet that's available at the information desk this morning in between the bathrooms and the Welcome Center. Um, please do sign up so that we can get you registered and you can get the email confirmation for that. Um, but that will be taking place on Saturday, February 10th at 1130 a.m. Also, we have an opportunity for our new members luncheon. Um, the next uh, new members luncheon will be taking place on Sunday. February 11th at uh, 11.45 or so, right after worship. Um, it'll be a, a, a light luncheon, followed by a, a little presentation that we do about the church, some history on the church, a bit of our governance, um, what it means to be a member of this church. Uh, and this is just sort of the preparatory information that we think everybody would need to make a decision on whether or not they would want to become a member of this congregation. If you come to this luncheon and you decide, nah, I don't want to be a member, totally fine. No pressure, but it is certainly a great way to get some questions answered about how things operate around this church. So that takes place on Sunday, February 10th, um, 11th, I'm sorry, February 11th uh, at approximately 1145 or so right after uh, this service. Then it is time for us to let you know that our Lenten uh, dinner and discussion series is going to begin um, the Dinner and Discussion Series takes place on Wednesday evenings all through Lent. Um, I can't believe we're talking about Lent already, but it's coming February 14th. Wednesday, February 14th. Yes, Valentine's Day is Ash Wednesday this year. Uh, we begin on Ash Wednesday and we run all the way through Lent. Every Wednesday evening we have a dinner at 6 p.m., followed by study uh, at about 6.45. This takes the place of our Wednesday evening study. So if you are a Wednesday evening study person, please come at 6 instead of 7. Enjoy dinner together with us and then stick around for study afterwards. If you're not a Wednesday night study person, this is a great way to become a Wednesday night study person. Come and eat and then be filled uh, with spiritual food afterwards. That begins Wednesday evening, uh, February 14th at 6 p.m. Uh, do we remember what we're serving the first night? Soup, salad, and bread, right? Soup, salad, and bread. Yes, okay. Um, 
One last announcement for you that we're very excited about. Uh, Texas Roadhouse here in Bloomingdale has provided an opportunity for us to do what's called a Dine to Donate event with them. Um, and so this will be taking place on Sunday, February 18th. Sunday, February 18th. <laughs> Instead of having coffee hour here at the church... Um, there will be no coffee hour. We'll still have coffee ready for those who need their cup of coffee when they come in in the morning. But instead of having coffee hour, we're going to invite everybody to go to Texas Roadhouse for lunch. If you bring the little uh, brochure that we're going to give you with you to Texas Roadhouse, 10% of everything that you spend at Texas Roadhouse will come back to us here at the church. Um, now, I want to tell you a few things about this. Um, Texas Roadhouse was really generous to us in allowing us to do this on a Sunday, which is not a normal thing for them, but because we're a church and because we said, hey, uh, our congregation, we feel like, would probably most benefit from doing this on a Sunday, plus we'd really like to just have our coffee hour at your place, they said, yeah, we'll, we'll give that a shot. So we have from 11 a.m. until 3 p.m. at Texas Roadhouse on Sunday, February 18th, if you go there anytime between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. and you eat or you do a call ahead order and pick it up and take it home um, or you do an online order, if you give them that form when you either are seated at your table or pick up your order, um, we will get 10% of everything you purchase except for alcohol, I believe. Um, but... Um, everything else, 10% of everything you purchase will come back to the church. So this is a really great opportunity. Um, my family will be there as quick as we can after church to um, greet you all and hang out with you guys over there for a little while. Um, but we would love to have you join us over at Texas Roadhouse for lunch on February 18th. Now, the one thing I will say, okay, I need a little a little bit of flexibility because Texas Roadhouse was willing to do this on a Sunday for us. The one thing you have to know is there may be a slight wait for a table because it's a Sunday, okay? So you just have to be a little prepared for that, but you can still do the seating thing on the app. You can um, sign up for seating or call ahead for seating um, when you go over there. So that will expedite you getting a table as well. But it's going to be a great opportunity. Let's see if we can fill the place, and it will help our bottom line a little bit as well. So that's Texas Roadhouse. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So once the, we, we have the flyer, we just thought it was a little early to pass it out. In the next couple of weeks, we'll have the, you'll have a paper flyer, and we'll also have it attached to the beacon, the midweek uh, newsletter. We can also email it to you. You can email it out. Yes, we can make it available however you want, but they just need to be able to present that, that flyer, okay? I think those are the announcements for today. Did I miss anything? Oh, boy, I missed something. Okay. Yes. Yes. Oh, there's a sign-up sheet for the new members' luncheon. Yes, so if you're interested in that, please do sign up so we know how much food to have for the luncheon. Um. You know, if, in case you didn't notice, we do food well because I think almost everything up there has to do with food. Um, on, in your bulletins this morning, you will also find our prayer list. We uh, would ask you to keep that in a place where you can see it throughout the week and be praying with us for each of those people. I just remind you, if you have a prayer request that you'd like to add, you can certainly do that by emailing the church office, calling the church office during church office hours, uh, or certainly just writing it down and dropping it in the tithe box um, is another way to provide those prayer requests to us. Would you please join me in a general word of prayer this morning? Well, Father, we do give you thanks and praise. We have a lengthy list of announcements this morning, but that means that there is life, Father. There is so much life happening in this place, and Lord, we are so grateful for everything that you are doing in this place. Lord, we are so grateful that you saw us safely through the annual meeting last week. And uh, Lord, even amid the cold temperatures, we had uh, a slightly larger group than we had the year before. And Father, we were so glad to hear all of the things that you did for us in 2023. 
and the amazing ways that you made ministry possible in this place. And Father, we are so very excited for the many things that you are lining up for us for 2024. Father, that means that we submit ourselves to you. We ask, Father, that we would be clay in your hands, that you would be the potter, that you would mold us and make us, that you would have us be the church that you need us to be, that you would show us each and every day the ministry that we need to tend to, the needs, the urgent needs of our community, those who need to hear the gospel, those who are hurting. Father, the church is nothing without its people, and the church is nothing without its mission. And so, Father, we do thank you for both of those things this morning, for the people and the mission of this church. Lord, this morning... We also think of all those on our prayer list. We think of those who have had surgery, those who are due to have surgery. We think of those who are traveling, those who will be traveling. We think of those who are sick, those who are injured, those who may be grieving a loss, Father, we think of those who have need. Perhaps it's financial need. Perhaps it's emotional needs or spiritual needs. Father, as the cold weather continues, we continue to pray for all of those who must work in the cold conditions. We think of all of our first responders, our policemen and women, our firefighters, emergency medical workers. And Father, of course, we think for those uh, we think of those who are going without shelter. Those who are hungry. Lord, we lay each and every one of these before you this morning. We ask, Father, that you would tend to each and every one of these people. That you would be the great healer and the great physician. That you'd bring the great bringer of all comfort that you would bring peace and joy, that you would be Jehovah Jireh, God, our provider. And Father, this morning we will hear about your amazing grace. And Lord, we will be called to gather at your table. We will be asked to consider our sin in light of your grace to confess our sin to you who is faithful and just. Father, this morning as we hear your word, as it falls fresh on us, will you begin now softening our hearts, preparing our hearts to hear this word about your grace? Will you help us to consider the sinfulness of our lives? And will you make us ready to stand before you and before one another, to gather with you at your table and be reminded once again of the gift of Jesus Christ, his death, and most importantly, his resurrection for us. So Father, we lay all of this before you. and We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Well, brothers and sisters, as we come to hear the word of God this morning, I would ask that you would stand as you are able for the reading of God's word. That as we hear this word, it would fall fresh on our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. As we continue our look at singing the wondrous story of God's word, we turn to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word for this day. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, brothers and sisters, the hymn, Amazing Grace, it is not quite as old as one might think it to be. I mean, don't get me wrong. It is an old hymn, but in comparison with the hymns that folks would count as the most notable hymns of the church, Amazing Grace is younger by far. For you see, the words of this hymn They are only a mere 244 years old. Some of the great hymns of faith date back more than a thousand years. So, by comparison, this hymn is but a mere baby. Even still, of all of the hymns that the church sings, it is this hymn that the church seems to know best. When we have a funeral, we sing this song because the words are so appropriate, but also because people know this song. Rarely do you find someone, even someone who is not necessarily a church goer, who has not at least heard the hymn Amazing Grace. And for that, we have its author to thank, the Reverend John Newton. A woman named Abby Fortin, who was a graduate of Geneva College located in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, wrote for the Geneva College website regarding John Newton and Amazing Grace. She said this, it was December 1772 in only England. At the age of 47, John Newton began writing a hymn that would grow increasingly more popular throughout the years. In his song, Amazing Grace, Newton writes about a grace that is immense. He writes about amazing grace, one that saved him out of his wretchedness. By looking within the hymn, Amazing Grace, one is able to understand a little bit about Newton's personal conversion. 
Although every person's conversion story is unique, there is something about this hymn that remains relatable to every Christian everywhere. Newton discusses where he was when he found God, or rather, when God found him. He was a wretch. He was lost. He was blind in sin. Newton's life was filled with interesting details, much different from anything that you or I have encountered. Uh, For some of his childhood, he had a relatively normal life. He had a mother and father with him. But Newton's father, however, was a sailor by trade. He made his living sailing up and down the African coast, looking for African men and women to capture, ultimately to take back to England to sell as slaves. At a young age, Newton's mother passed away, and so Newton joined his father at sea, taking up the family business of capturing slaves to be sold in England. In 1745, Newton himself became a slave for a short time. He was captured, taken by the Princess Paye, a ruler of the tribe of the Sherbo people in what is modern-day Sierra Leone. He was rescued, but rather than take that experience as a sign, perhaps from God, that this was a a bad choice for his life, Newton returned to the seas and to the slave trade. In the year 1748, while captain aboard the ship Greyhound, John Newton had a life-altering experience that did lead him to the Lord. I think you'll find this life-altering experience sounds a little like something you've heard before. His ship found itself caught in the thickest part of a ferocious storm squall just off the coast of Ireland. For hours, Newton tried to right the ship's course to no avail, fearing the absolute worst. Newton decided at one last resort, perhaps he should turn to God. So he began to pray for God's mercy, for forgiveness from his sin, and that God might see fit to let the storm pass and spare the lives of the people aboard the ship. As Newton prayed, the storm began to ease, and the ship sailed into calmer waters. Sound familiar? Interestingly enough, it would take almost four weeks for the waters to calm completely enough that the ship could return to shore and dock in low, swilly Ireland. Newton recalled that this experience was the beginning of his conversion to Christianity. Newton's ship finally then docked in Great Britain in March of 1748, and by that time, Newton had become a voracious reader of the Bible and of Christian literature. He had given his life fully to Christ, and it took six more years. Unfortunately, he had a stroke. But Newton finally gave up the treachery of the seas, and by the year 1754, Newton traded his sea legs for land legs and docked his ship for the last time. In 1757, Newton applied to become an Anglican priest, a clergy member of the Church of England. However, due to his past on the sea and dealing in the slave trade, it would take nearly six years for Newton to convince the church to confirm him for ordination as a priest. Newton's work began to focus on helping the poor, the needy, He became well known for his warm, kind, pastoral care. His preaching became so powerful and popular that his church had to add a gallery or a balcony for people to sit in in order to have sufficient seating for all those who would come to hear him speak. Of course, today, John Newton is probably best known for his hymn writing. That is probably his longest lasting and greatest gift to the church at large. In 1767, a poet named William Cowper moved to the small town of Olney where Newton was preaching. And the two quickly became friends and together they created a hymnal simply titled The Olney Hymns. Among the most well-known hymns to be featured in this hymnal, How Sweet the Name Jesus Sounds, 
glorious things of thee are spoken and amazing grace. Many of John Newton's hymns are also preserved in one of the oldest American hymnals known to exist, the songbook of the American frontier called the Sacred Harp. This hymnal was used widely across many different denominations and church settings during the movement called the Second Great Awakening in the United States, in which a a series of revival movements happened from 1790 until 1810. When the Third Great Awakening happened in the United States, more commonly called the Sawdust Revival Movement, that happened here in the United States from 1930 to 1950, young preachers such as the Reverend Billy Graham and Billy Sunday turned back to the Sacred Harp Hymnal and once again found the music of John Newton that filled their tents and their revivals. Why? Why? Because those hymns stood the test of time. They they spoke powerfully about one's depraved condition of sin and their need for forgiveness. And most importantly, everybody knew these hymns. Even if they had never been to church before, even if they hadn't been to church for a really long time, they knew the words to amazing grace. So you see, we've come full circle. Even today, preachers lean on amazing grace, holy, 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 because people have heard them. People know them. And by the way, when people know a song, guess what they do? They sing, right? And when people sing, it's beautiful. So as a result, it is estimated that Amazing Grace is sung some 10 million times every single year in the United States alone. One funeral director wrote about the song Amazing Grace. He said, its message of redemption and God's compassion connects to all people, no matter where they were in the moments before they walked into that funeral service, that song means something to them. Isn't that true, brothers and sisters? Think about the words. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will see me home. You might wonder, where did John Newton borrow these ideas for amazing grace from? Well, certainly the song is recalling his own life, how he came out of the blindness of his seafaring life and into the clarity of his life with Christ. We began this message series, though, with one point that I stress to you all. The importance of the songs we sing and how they should sing Scripture. So... What scripture has John Newton communicated to us and what words from God are being communicated when we sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound? Well, if I'm being truthful to you, the hymn Amazing Grace has exactly zero direct quotes from scripture. Amazing Grace is not an example of actually singing the Bible. You will not turn open your Bible and find somewhere that Paul or Peter or one of the prophets wrote, once I was lost, but now I am found. Once I was blind, but now I see. However, the concept of turning away from sin, the idea of God's rich and abundant grace for those who are otherwise poor, wretched sinners, well, that idea is profoundly available in Scripture. And so we could turn to any number of passages this morning to prove Newton's words, but I have chosen to turn to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Because there is an interesting paradox that unfolds in Paul's words to the Ephesians. At the same time that one is alive in their sin, they are simultaneously dead in their transgression. Here's what I mean by that. Newton must have felt this way when he sailed those stormy seas again and again. Sure, he was alive. And for the most part, he was doing quite well for himself. It was advantageous to be a slave trader. Sad as it is to say, 
There was great demand for slaves, and the slave trade was a profitable business. Each time that Captain Newton successfully navigated his ship through another storm, you can, felt, you can, you can believe he felt more and more alive, a little more accomplished. He had another dollar in his pocket. But Newton's story quickly shows us that something was missing. Something wasn't right. By all human calculations, Newton was alive and well, but deep down inside, John Newton, he felt dead. In his autobiographical book, John Newton said of his life, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. The Apostle Paul, as he opens chapter 2 of Ephesians, sounded a lot like Newton. Or, Or maybe it was Newton that sounded a lot like Paul. But either way, they're on the same page. This is what Paul said. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Dead. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thought. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. We felt alive. We thought we were doing great. We were dead. Can't you hear the Ephesian people arguing with Paul? How can you say we were dead, Paul? We, we weren't dead. Can't you see us? We're very much alive. We're doing all kinds of things. Alive, perhaps. But the question is, well? Are you alive and well? Being well is a, a matter of perspective, I suppose. If by well you mean that you're walking through life with no more hope to live and die... No more hope than when death comes, you'll suffer pain and death forever. Well, then sure, I suppose you're alive and well. But that's not how God defines being alive. That's certainly not what John Newton discovered Being alive meant when he transitioned from once being lost to now being found. To be alive means so much more. It means life. It means living. It means life forever with God and Christ. But that life cannot. It does not come until one has first learned that they previously understood living in the wrong way. It actually wasn't life at all. You were dead in your transgressions and your sin. What you thought gave you hope and encouragement, something to live for, it was actually the thing that brought your demise. For example, like the addict who believes that they can't live without a drink, a a smoke, a a a hit, whatever it is. Like the thief who believes that they cannot live without stealing to make their way. Like the liar who believes that, that the truth is too painful to bear. Sin might feel like living, but it's not life. It's death. It brings death. It assures death. It might sound like Paul is a bit of a downer this morning, by the way. This isn't the most encouraging message thus far. But here's the thing, brothers and sisters. There is good news in Paul's words. In fact, there's more good news in Paul's words than bad. The evidence of this is one simple word. You were, you were dead in your transgressions and your sin in which you used to live. John Newton used the very same kind of language in this hymn, didn't he? I once was lost. I once was blind. Grace relieved my fears. And all of this happened the hour that I first believed. The apostle Paul agrees He says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. For it is by grace you have been saved. So I want to share with you this morning the good news of grace in spite of our sin. The good news of grace in spite of our sin. And here's the first point. Paul has this beautiful two words for us. 
but God. But God. The first evidence of good news in spite of our sin is but God. Our salvation was God's idea. John Newton completely understood that grace was entirely God's idea, not ours. Listen to what he once wrote. He said, God has been pleased in loving kindness to draw us to himself and to be found by us when we sought him not. Some might ask a simple question of Mr. Newton. How can something, more importantly, how can someone be found when no one was looking for that thing or that person in the first place? Have you ever heard of someone who just recently made a big purchase? Maybe something like some new furniture or a new car. They're telling you about the big purchase that they just made. And they say something like this. I wasn't even looking for a whatever it was. The opportunity just fell in my lap. Anybody ever heard somebody say something like that? I wasn't even looking for a new car. I went in to have an oil change and I drove home with a new car. From time to time, we find ourselves purchasing something, finding something that we weren't even looking for. That is how Newton understood God's grace. He seemed to see grace as a gift so valuable, so valuable that it could never be calculated. It was so necessary that we could never actually state its importance. And yet, so many people in the world, himself included, didn't have the least bit of interest in it. William MacDonald, the great Bible scholar, he writes about this. He says, the words, but God, form one of the most significant, eloquent, and inspiring transitions in all of literature. They indicate that a stupendous change has taken place. It is a change from the doom and despair of the valley of death to the unspeakable delights of the kingdom of the Son of God's love. The author of change is God himself. No one else could have done it, and no one else would have done it. The author of change must be God, for in 99 out of 100 cases, man had no idea that he was even shopping for grace, let alone in need of it. But God, who is rich in mercy, but God, who has incomparable love for us, but God, who has watched us walk in this world, dead in our sin and transgression, made us alive in Christ Jesus our Lord. It isn't me. It isn't we. It's he. Salvation was His idea. It is his idea. It will always be his idea. We're alive. We have the promise of life, and it's all because God took the opportunity to interject in our lives. But God. The second beautiful grace moment in spite of our sin. God's grace. God's grace equals some things. First, it equals incomparable riches. Secondly, it equals God's kindness in Jesus Christ. Thirdly, it equals not anything we can do. And finally, it equals God's gift in Jesus. These four statements about God's grace might seem like the most obvious statements to you and I, but that's because, hopefully, we have become seasoned grace getters. More times than we would like to admit, we have been the beneficiaries of God's infinite grace. Amen? Amen. Wait a second. For people who have been beneficiaries of God's infinite grace, we have been more times than we would like to admit, beneficiaries of God's grace. Amen? Oh, thank the Lord. I thought it was only me. (sighs) More times than we would like to admit. There's this hymn from another great hymn writer, Julia Johnston, that describes it so well. It says, marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there were the lamb, the blood of the lamb was spilt. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all of our sin. 
God's grace is greater than anything we can think or imagine. Paul tells us this, but most importantly, it is greater than all of our sin. What makes God's grace so great? Well, first, the apostle Paul tells us that God's grace is actually made up of incomparable riches of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, when we were dead in our transgressions and our sin, our access to these incomparable riches of God were restricted, not by God, but by us. We're the ones that shut the door to the incomparable riches. But when we confess that sin, when we turn away from that sin, we regain full access to those incomparable riches. What makes up those riches? Well, Paul defines those incomparable riches as the kindness of Jesus. Dr. Warren Wearsby defined them or boiled them down into three points. The, sh- the kindness of Jesus is three particular movements. He says, first, God loved us in Jesus. Secondly, he gave us life in Jesus. And third, he kept us in Jesus. John 3.16 confirms that, right? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, whoever believes will not perish. He loved us, he gave us, he kept us. But notice these incomparable riches of God, this kindness of Jesus, it's not something that we have done or could ever do. It is entirely the gift of God. It is a gift to us in Christ Jesus. And so we're right back where we began, picking up something we didn't even know we were shopping for. So here's one final good news of God's grace announcement in spite of our sin this morning. We are still God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus, even though we are sinners. John Newton wrote it this way. He said, the Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. As long as life endures. A young boy spent a summer's afternoon playing outside after an entire week of nothing but rain. The constant rainfall left puddles, and mud pits. It wasn't long before that boy discovered that that very wet soil, those mud pits, could be molded in his hands like clay. Soon, the boy, covered from head to toe in mud, came to the door and offered his mother a gift. It's a flower pot, he said, covered in dirt. The little boy had fashioned a rudimentary pot from this clay, picked a few dwindling dandelions, which had now began to wilt from the heat to fill the pot. The mother's heart burst with joy in spite of the little muddy boy's appearance. She carefully placed that little pot in the sun in hopes that the heat might bake that mud hard enough that she might keep it for a little while. Many years later, the now grown-up boy was sorting through his mother's belongings after she had passed away. He came across a box marked flower pot, fragile. He carefully took that box off of the closet shelf. He opened it gently, and sure enough, there inside of what seemed like a thousand Kleenex tissues was a little baked mud pot. It had cracked and a piece had broken off, but it was still recognizable as the pot that he had made that day in the mud puddle, proof positive that the handiwork, carefully shielded and protected, will endure. 
Have you ever considered what verses 8 through 10 of our text today if, mean if they are just a continuous thought? I think so often we read them as two separate thoughts, but what if we take them by themselves as one cohesive thought? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he has prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's handiwork. We have been created by him in Christ Jesus to do good work. But just as with every other instance of God's creation, if he created it, guess what he's going to do? Preserve it. What evidence do we have of this truth? Grace. Amazing grace. It is by grace you have been saved. It is by grace you have been put in the box and had a thousand Kleenex tissues put around you. It is by grace through faith that you have endured. Grace is the tissue God has put around you inside the box. It is what has preserved you. By the way, it is grace That will be the thing that on the last day when we stand before God, God will take you, hold you up and say, look at this amazing thing that I have made. Grace. God's amazing grace. Amen? Let's pray together. Oh, Father, thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for wrapping us in your amazing grace that we might endure. For it is by your grace we have been saved. We will be preserved. It is not our work. It is a gift from you. Help us, Father, to get out of the way. Help us to stop thinking that there's something we can do for ourselves. And Lord, help us be reminded every single day that we exist, we live, we thrive, we grow, and we have life only because of your amazing grace. Father, thank you for this. In Jesus Christ, let the church cry out. Amen. Brothers and sisters, amazing grace. How sweet the sound of it. Not sure how many times I've said to you, there is nothing magical that happens at this table. There's nothing magical, there's nothing mystical. This is bread and this is juice. It will remain bread and juice. But it is what this bread and this juice represent that is so important to us. It is what this bread and this juice reminds us of that is important. And what this bread and this juice reminds us of is amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That night when Jesus was betrayed, how sweet the sound. That night when Jesus said, Father, if it be your will, let this cap pass from me, but not as I will, Father, as you will. And so he went like a lamb uncomplaining forth for you. Amazing grace. That night when he suffered and he breathed his last and he said, it is finished for you. Amazing grace grace. So brothers and sisters, as we prepare to meet at this table, will you in the silence of this space consider your hearts before him that we might be made ready to taste and see and be reminded of amazing grace this morning. Let's confess our sin silently before God this morning.
But Father, we do confess that we have sinned against you in thought, in word, and in deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. And what we deserve for that sin is punishment, it's death. But Father, in your incomparable riches, in your kindness in Jesus Christ, in your love for us, you saw fit to trade that death and instead give us life. And yes, Father, you did ask something of us. You asked that we would come and bow our knee before you, bow our hearts, bow our heads before you and confess our sin. And more than that, Father, that we would be eager to turn away from that sin, to leave it behind and live a new life, risen in you. And so that's our prayer this morning, Father, that you would help us to die to our sin and rise with you. To turn away from our sin and to live life with you. Father, thank you for your word that tells us as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our sin from us that we might be made ready to come to this table as brothers and sisters together, the family of God, to be reminded that you so loved us, that you gave your son for us, and that you keep us and you preserve us until that day when Jesus comes for us. Father, we thank you for this. In the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Brothers and sisters, on the night in which our Savior was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it for his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, broken for you, for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he took a cup and he poured it for them. And he said, drink of this, all of you. For this cup is the cup of the new covenant, shed in my blood for the remission of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Brothers, and sisters, whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are reminded, but God, who is rich in mercy, has shared with us incomparable riches of amazing grace in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. This morning we will serve you in the pews, and I'll remind you, that we have bread and all of the cups, regardless of color, are grape juice. The table has been prepared.
brothers and sisters, as you're able, would you stand, join hands with the person next to you this morning? Father, we thank you for meeting us here this morning with amazing grace. We thank you for the love that you have shown us, the incomparable riches in Christ Jesus that you have for us. We thank you that you have promised us grace to preserve us and protect us. Father, as we go out into this world, as we go to battle against Satan, against the things that come to torment us, against the things that want to push us off of the right path, your path, as we go to, to share the gospel with a world that just doesn't want to hear it. As we go with the gift of amazing grace for people who have no idea that they're shopping for it. Lord, will you give us strength? Will you give us courage for the battle ahead? And will you remind us each and every day that we have that same amazing grace to see us through every single day? Father, thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as you go from this place, go with the love of God our Father, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to be yours this day and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures Wonderful day, everybody.